Hello, my name is Mark Calder. I'm the Regional Manager for Embrace the Middle East in Scotland and the north of England. Embrace the Middle East partners with Middle East Christians who are working to transform the lives of the most marginalised and vulnerable in their communities. Our work is inspired by the invitation of Christ to care for those most in need and a commitment to support the continued social witness of Middle East Christians. Throughout the Bible, the body of Christ is called to look out for the most marginalised and vulnerable among us. Together with our partners, we seek to respond to this calling by enabling our partners to provide a long-term response to the needs around them, whether it's providing support and a future for those displaced from their homes as a result of conflict, bringing education and social interaction to children who would otherwise be isolated and cut off because of ongoing cultural stigmas around disability, enabling access to life-saving medical treatment which would otherwise be out of reach, empowering young mums to bring up healthy children and supporting the training of the next generation of leaders, carers and teachers. The value we put on building lasting relationships with our partners is what sets Embrace apart from many other charities. These relationships allow us to build well-managed and resourced initiatives together, which empower our partners to bring the lasting change they seek in their communities. Partner with us as we live out God's call to act justly, love mercy and walk humbly with our God. Now I was due to be with you in Alloa this Pentecost Sunday to tell you a bit about what Embrace does. Um, Embrace the Middle East, as you saw from that video, works in a variety of ways, from northern Iraq through Lebanon, Palestine, Israel and Egypt, working with refugees, working with women who are excluded from the workforce, working with people uh, who are disabled, people who have been the victims of serious injustice, such as having their livelihoods ruined uh, or their trees uprooted or driven from their homes, such as in the north of Iraq, by the Islamic State. Today is Pentecost Sunday, and if there's one word we might associate most with Pentecost, it's power. This past week in politics has underlined for many of us just how powerless we as ordinary people feel, how inadequately represented we may feel, how distant and cut off we may feel from the decisions that mean life or death to some of our neighbours and friends and loved ones. The story of Pentecost paints this very vivid picture of the power of God descending upon the first followers of Jesus uh, a few days after his ascension. The fire and the smoke of Pentecost evoke intentionally the descent of God's presence at Sinai uh, when the Israelites were established as the nation that were to be the custodians as well as the recipients of divine law. But these Middle Eastern men and women sat in an upper room in Jerusalem, in a city in an occupied territory at the fringes of the empire, certainly did not look very powerful. They were hiding away after their leader had left them in quite mysterious circumstances a few days previously. And then all of a sudden, these Galileans, these provincials, are performing signs and wonders in a nation's capital under the noses of imperial and temple authorities. So what does this story mean for us today? And what might Pentecost power look like today? So to provide some answers, why don't we go for a walk just a few miles west of where that upper room is to modern day South Tel Aviv. We're walking with a man called Dov, one of Embrace the Middle East partners there. We're walking past dilapidated high rise buildings, We're going through a deserted bus station, down streets full of the signs of deprivation. There are sex workers trying to get customers. There are addicts on every street corner. Organised crime dominates parts of this neighbourhood. 
And Dov works with victims of homelessness and addiction in South Tel Aviv. He's told us to wear strong shoes and as we crunch over needles that have been discarded on the concrete here, we're glad we did. At a certain point we seem to be walking towards a pile of dirty blankets, but as we get closer we double take. The blankets are moving and they begin to yield a human form. The man that emerges is covered in sores, sores on his arms and his legs that we can see, which are the result of years of crystal meth use. I'm conscious of my own fear as I'm confronted by this person. I'm confronted by the implied world of pain that's concealed by a face, that's concealed by a hat pulled over his face. But Dov doesn't recoil as I do. Dov kneels next to him, speaks to him quietly in Hebrew, and finds out that the man, for whatever reason this day, doesn't want to come back to Dov's centre for a meal tonight. So as we move on, I remain feeling troubled and unsettled and reflect how much more comfortable I was with the idea that that was a pile of dirty blankets than someone's life. You see, Dub sees neither just a pile of dirty blankets nor does he see simply the abjection and pain and loss of a man who's enslaved by a really vicious master. Dov sees this. Dov sees a meal table around which people, being freed from the things that keep them captive, are able to relate as equals in the presence of God, that master of feasts as the New Testament has him. I see these two pictures as a kind of ethical call and response from the concealed face to a meal table around which uncovered faces face each other. Of course, today, here, we can't gather around any table just now, Eucharistic or otherwise, and increasingly we're covering our faces, but the ethical call is as urgent as ever. Without the face-to-face, -face, deprived of everyday encounters with others, I think there's a danger of losing both the truth of other people, their infinite complexity, and also losing the full weight of obligation that we have to one another. And doing the imaginative work of taking that walk around South Tel Aviv, choosing to call to mind the troubling reality of other people's faces, is perhaps more urgent than ever. Despite the fire and the smoke of Pentecost, I don't think it's about becoming so full of supernatural power or so heavenly minded that we become of no earthly use. The gift of languages in the Pentecost story points in the other direction. Pentecost is, has something to do with finding new ways of relating to those who are otherwise beyond our reach. The spirit of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, is what gives us eyes to look into desperate situations, into piles of dirty blankets, and not to recoil, to look into faces that are lined with pain, but not to despair, not to give up. And the power of Pentecost is what enables us to be part of a transformation that ultimately, we believe, places all people around the feast table of God. I don't know where you're seeing dirty blankets just now. For me, often it's on social media. And I have to call to mind that there are lives, there are faces, there are universes of experience behind each angry post. Maybe the closed doors of our neighbours' flats and houses have become to us kind of piles of dirty blankets where we're forgetting the lives behind them. And actually, for years, my impression is that many people in our country have looked at the Middle East simply as a huge pile of dirty blankets, a mess which no one can do anything about. But Pentecost's 
uh, insistence is that we do not despair and that we look beyond the idea of a pile of dirty blankets. The spirit of Pentecost is calling forth words and actions in us that seek the faces that might be hidden within those blankets. It drives us to consider how we place ourselves around the same table with these concealed others as guests of the great other who wore a face for us. That's all very well, I hear you say, but I'm tired, I'm lonely, I'm struggling to keep my head above water just now in this lockdown. I'm desperate to escape. Sure, I feel the same. <laughs> and I find some comfort in St Paul's letter, his second letter to the Corinthians, which reminds us both of this divine power and the inescapable fact that we are just still clay vessels. But it's important to remember that Pentecost's power came at the end of a lockdown. It came at the end of time spent behind closed doors, feeling bereft, feeling lost and powerless. But a time spent in prayer. It is prayer that embrace partners like Dov and so many others ask for from us and our supporters more than anything else. In prayer, this divine otherness encounters us in the face of Jesus Christ and we glimpse, according to St Paul, the same light of love that brought all into being. Because of Pentecost, because of the indwelling of the Spirit, we are empowered to relate beyond simply seeing piles of dirty blankets. At Pentecost the disciples didn't really bring anything with them. They didn't bring anything to the table but their time in prayer, their time in lockdown. Having said that, they did ultimately leave their upper room. They did turn their faces to the big and noisy, confusing, very often hostile world. They turned their faces, as Dov does every single night when he takes those walks, towards others, rather than looking away, as I want to do so often. And somehow, simply in the turning of our faces towards these blankets, it, simply in looking harder at what might be within, God's glory is made known and his power has an opportunity to be expressed. On behalf of Embrace the Middle East and on behalf of our partners, my invitation this Pentecost is that we turn, that we turn our faces, that we look carefully at the piles of dirty blankets that are here around us in our own country, but also in the Middle East. That we look at the lives hidden by the Gaza blockade, the worlds of pain contained within refugee camps in northern Iraq or in the slums of Beirut. In such places, our partners are choosing to see the potential for a feast. And believe me, if you stand in some of these places, in a refugee camp or in a, a slum, or standing in a field where soldiers have ripped up a farmer's livelihood that was his olive trees or his, his groves, seeing the potential for feasting takes supernaturally transformed eyes. It is a different spirit that we need. But Dov and all of our partners are local Middle Eastern Christians who have that spirit, who believe that even the most mundane act of love is in the power of the spirit of Pentecost, part of God's kingdom, God's great feast coming on earth. So it's my privilege as part of Embrace the Middle East to invite you as Christians in Scotland and other Christians across the UK to participate in our partners' work. To participate through prayer, when we're out of lockdown to participate through visiting and where possible to participate through giving. And this participation is animated by the same hope and the same spirit that animates our partners and that animated their forebears, the first Middle Eastern Christians there in that upper room at the very first Pentecost. Thank you for your support. <laughs>